So while Elise is getting getting the presentation going here, I'll just take a second to, uh, to introduce myself to get that out of the way. So my name is Elaine Evans, and I am um, been leading these bumblebee surveys across Minnesota for a while. Um, so I am an extension educator and researcher here at the University of Minnesota, I'm specializing in pollinators and pollinator conservation, but I've been doing a lot of work with bumblebees for, for a few decades here. So, um, so yeah, uh, welcome, excited to have you all here to, uh, to learn about bumblebees and how to participate in the Atlas. And it's yeah, been, um, yeah, it's been been really, um, we've learned a lot. We'll, we'll go over some of the highlights of what we've learned so far, but still have a lot of areas to cover, a lot more to learn with your help. Excellent. Thanks, Elaine. Um, so my name is Elise Bernstein. I know I've emailed back and forth with a handful of you, but I'm the program coordinator for the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas. Um, and I also work for the University of Minnesota Bee Squad. I'm doing a lot of outreach and education work and then um, I help Elaine out with all sorts of bumblebee related tasks, um, but I'm excited to get started on our first uh, bumblebee atlas training of 2023. Uh, someone had something in the chat wondering <clears throat> if anybody else lost audio, <laughs> um, hoping that that people can still hear us. Okay, a couple okay. people are saying it's it's good there. So, um, Janet, I hope that that. <laughs> that that you can get the audio back and, and hear us. We do have this recorded, so if you do need to go back um, and and catch any parts that you might have missed from technology, we do, we, we will have the recording available. Yes. All right. So just an outline of what we're gonna do today. Um, we're well. We've just done our welcome. Um, so we're gonna transition into some natural history, behavior, and ecology information about bumblebees. Um, then we'll talk about the bumblebee atlas survey protocols. Uh, we'll take a short break for you to stretch your legs, grab a sip of water, use the restroom if needed, um, and then we'll finish up with some bumblebee ID basics, and then we'll review and wrap up. All right. So we have a lot of different species of native bees here in Minnesota and across the entire United States. Um, there are nearly 4,000 different species of native bees, but bumblebees make up only 1.4% of those uh, species of native bees. So bumblebees um, have four life stages. They begin as eggs, uh, which you can see here in the top left. Um, they're very small, um, sort of look like a little grain of rice. Um, those eggs then develop into larva, as you can see here on the right. Um, those larva then become pupa, and the pupa eventually develop into um, adult bees, which is what we are looking for in our bumblebee surveys. And bumblebees are northern adapted creatures. Um, they're adapted to cooler climates. So they have really thick coats of hair. Um, I'm sure that's kind of what all of you think of when you think of a bumblebee. That's kind of the stereotypical thing that most people think of when they think of bumblebees um, is that really fuzzy, hairy body. Uh, bumblebees also have a unique ability to, to raise their body temperatures. Um, they have an annual life cycle. So any, any bumblebee that you see is just living for one season. And the queen bumblebees have a sort of antifreeze in their blood that allows them to survive our really, really harsh, cold Minnesota winters. So let's talk about the life cycle of a bumblebee. So we're going to begin up here in the top left corner. So this is our queen that is overwintering. So she is about six feet underground. Um, she's got that antifreeze in her blood that's helping her stay alive for the winter. And as the winter starts to transition into spring, that queen will emerge from underground. She will then begin the nest searching process um, where she's looking for a place that's suitable to create her nest. Some species of bumblebees nest above ground and others nest underground. Um, so this uh, little graphic depicts a queen that is starting her nest in an underground spot. So she'll begin to start her nest. Uh, she creates these little wax pots to store pollen and nectar and to lay her eggs. So eventually she'll start laying those eggs, which will then develop into larva and eventually into pupa. And then they will become additional workers that can then help to support the colony. So then those workers uh, will leave the nest, they'll fly out and forage and bring back um, pollen and nectar to support the colony. 
The colony will continue to grow uh, as the summer moves on. Uh, it will grow in size. And then towards the end of the season, um, that colony will start producing new queens and males. Um, then our original queen that we had over here, she's seen here, um, will die off. And those new queens will then leave the colony. They will find males to mate with. Um, and then the new queens will find a place to spend the winter six feet underground, just like that original queen had. And the rest of this colony will actually die. The rest of the colony does not survive the winter. It's only our queen bumblebees that are surviving our winters. So here is a video. I know it's really hard to see where, where our queen is, um, but this is a video of a queen bumblebee um, that is looking for a place to make her nest. Um, so you can see it looks like she's kind of flying around a little frantically, but she's just searching for a place where she can either um, go underground to start her nest or a place that is above ground. There she is. All right, so that nest is established by our queen who starts out um, as a solitary queen. It's just her because she's the only one who survived the winter. Um, like I mentioned, some species of bumblebees will nest on the surface of the ground, while others will build their nests underground. Um, but all bumblebees require some sort of pre-existing insulation to protect their nests, um, to keep them um, warm and insulated. Um, and abandoned rodent colonies or rodent dens are actually fairly common sites for bumblebee nests. Um, Elaine and I have rescued a couple bumblebee colonies um, from, from people's yards or garages, and I know that one of them we got last summer was in um, an old mouse nest. So this is what that bumblebee colony will eventually look like as the queen starts laying those eggs and the eggs begin to develop into workers. You can see those little um, wax pots uh, where pollen and nectar will be stored. So as we move throughout the season, um, the colony completes that life cycle. Uh, the new queens will then find places to overwinter. So in this video, um, our new queen is, is digging herself underground, um, trying to get six feet under there so she can survive our, our really cold, harsh Minnesota winters. All right, so we can't talk about um, our nesting bumblebees without talking about Scytheris. So this is one subgenus of bumblebee. Uh, these are known as cuckoo bees. Uh, so they usurp the nests of other bumblebees. Uh, so queen cuckoo bees do not collect pollen. Um, so they're, they're often a little bit less hairy and they don't have pollen baskets, which is something important to keep in mind uh, for bumblebee ID is that the um, queen cuckoo bees don't have pollen baskets like other females do. So these bees have no reproductive casts, only queens and males are produced, and the host species is the one that is providing the workers. Uh, so queens have strong stingers and really thick exoskeletons uh, to protect them from defensive stings when they invade the nest of another of the host species and kill that queen. Um, these, these queen cuckoo bumblebees may also hide in the nest, um, acquire the smells of the nest that they're invading, and eventually replace the eggs with their own. Um, and in some cases, they may coexist with the existing queen for a while. I'm going to turn it over to Elaine now uh, to talk about tongue length. Yeah, so just giving you some some highlights of some of the cool ecology stuff with bumblebees. There's of course a ton more, but um, but we have to we have a lot of stuff to talk about. But one of the the main kind of things that are important for bumblebee communities, how they kind of divide themselves up on the floral resources, is their tongue length. So compared to all of those other bees that Elise was talking about. Bumblebees have much longer tongues than most other bees, but even just within bumblebees, they vary a lot. So from five to 12 millimeters, um, 
which is, you know, all sounds small to us, but on the B scale, it can make a huge difference in terms of the flowers that they can access. So that this tongue length um, helps them split themselves up and reduce competition. So it's something you might notice when you're out looking at bumblebees, you might notice seeing some kinds of bumblebees on some flowers, other kinds of bumblebees on other flowers. Um, this has also been found to be a pretty adaptable trait. So um, tongue length does vary over time. There was a fairly recent study that was um, that found that um, looking at climate change, impacting bumblebees, um, having them have shorter tongues as the climate was changing the, the floral resources in the area. Oh, um, you can go to the next one, Elise. I forgot that I don't, I can't forward it. <laughs> Um, so, so why not all have long tongues? You know, these bees that have the long tongues, they're able to, to go into these flowers that have the long tubes. So it seems like if you have the long tongue, you can just get to all those flowers, but it actually does um, decrease their ability to be efficient with the shorter flowers. So the long tongue bees are really efficient on the deep flowers and the short tongue bees are really efficient on, on short flowers. You can go to the next one. And here is a video of one way that the short tongue bees kind of get around um, not being able to get to those long tube flowers. So this is actually a rusty patch bumblebee on a bee balm plant. And um, you can see the kind of pollen and, and the tube opening up at the end of the flower, but she's going in more towards the base of the flower. And you can see um, her sticking her tongue in there. So um, she's actually not being a great pollinator. She's avoiding the pollen and just going for the nectar in the plants by um, using, uh, a lot of times they'll use a hole that was cut by another bee. So carpenter bees, which we don't, aren't very common in Minnesota, but um, they also do this. There's other bumblebees that do this, but sometimes they will just, just cut the holes themselves. You can go to the, to the next one now another behavior to watch for while you're out there. You may also see mating. Um, so, so towards that end of the colony cycle, when the new queens and males are produced, they leave the colony. And sometimes you can see these mating pairs out there. So um, the, the, when you're seeing the new males and queens, that usually means that the colonies that they came from are towards the end. Um, the, those males don't really have a lot that they're doing in the nest. Their main function is mating. So a lot of them leave the nest and don't return. And you can actually, in the, in the um, later summer, sometimes you'll see clusters of males out on flowers. So they'll, they'll kind of cluster together to, to try to keep warm with each other. Sometimes they're, they're just on, on grass, um, on the flowers and uh, some, something to watch out for. You can go to the next one. So here is a vid video. This is a little bit unusual. The, it, it's not too uncommon to see a, a couple males trying to, to mate with, with one female. They're just um, trying to, to do what they can to get their mating done. But this was the most I'd ever seen on, on one female. So um, there were, I think, six males that were all glommed onto one female. There's only one male that's likely actually mating, but they're all just super attracted to the female, glom onto her. Um, kind of fun, fun stuff to watch out for in the late summer. You can go to the next slide. Another, um, there, there's a few different behaviors that you can also look for that are related to mating. So this is a slow motion video. And um, this is from a, a male that, is perching. So you could see him perching there on the tip of that flower. And then he is taking off and patrolling an area. Um, in a second here, you can actually see um, another bee come by and, and he's um, chasing them. And, um, and then he, he comes back over and will just land back at this flower. Um, so, so you'll, uh, with, with this species, this is the uh, black and gold bumblebee. The, the, it's, it's not too uncommon to, to see the males um, out there doing this. The males that do this tend to have really big eyes. 
can go to the to the next one. Oh, yep, there goes there goes the bee zooming by, and then he's taking off after <laughs> after them. They also, um, and so besides perching, the males will also just find nests and um, gather there. So, so this is a nest. This was actually out in Utah with a species we don't have in Minnesota, but we have some Minnesota species that do this behavior too, where they'll just, um, it's kind of hard to see, but there's multiple males that are kind of crawling around here. There's a nest that's just in that leaf litter there. And these males are just kind of chasing after anything that that's coming out. They're waiting for queens to to emerge from the nest and um so they can just grab them while they're while they're flying out you can go to the to the next slide now so um so elise already mentioned these that the new queens over winter there's a lot some that we know and a lot that we don't know so we know these queens are usually digging themselves a couple inches down into the soil they're often on north facing slopes. You can go to the, to the next slide. Uh, but we don't know a lot about where, where they're always doing this, those habitat associations. Are they in wooded areas? Are they in grasslands? The specifics for most species aren't known. So any kind of observations of Bumblebee queens digging around in the soil in the fall are, are really, um, really important to learn about. And we also don't know survival rates. So we don't know how many bees, how many of these queens survive that point. So, you know, look at learning about the colony cycle. These queens are the only connection to, to the population next year. So these queens, um, you know, will, will be coming out and, and forming all the colonies. We don't know where their stress points are most, if it's actually surviving the winter, if it's finding nest sites, if it's finding resources in the spring, we know that um, a lot of queens don't make it to the point of producing a successful colony, but we still have a lot to learn just about any bumblebee species for where those stressors happen most. Okay, you can move to the next slide. All right, so we're already ready now. Um, you know, we're we're do. I think we're doing kind of okay on time. If anyone wants to unmute and and ask questions about the the ecology at this point, or you can feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we're going to switch over, and Elisa is going to talk about the protocol. So I'm happy to answer questions about ecology and biology in the chat, um, and, unless anybody has uh, wants to unmute and, and ask anything right now. How many bumblebee species are there in Minnesota? Okay, yep, we'll be getting to that. Okay. <laughs> but it's, it's 24. <laughs> Spoiler, but. <laughs> uh, can you hear me, Elaine? Yes. Uh, Janet Nelson here. Um, do you prefer video or uh, a video or just photographs of um, bee activity like digging a hole or um, bee on bee love? <laughs> yeah, yeah, either are fine. Um, you know, sometimes with the video, you can see see more different angles so we can get it, make sure that we get a good species ID. But as long as the photos are enough to see what species it is, and, and we'll be learning about um, how I will be teaching how to how to best do that for these different species. Great, um, thank you. That works, yeah. All right, maybe you can get started on the protocols. I'll answer a couple of questions in the chat here. Perfect. All right, so why have we chosen bumblebees? Why are we surveying bumblebees? Uh, so in North America, actually about one third of all of our bumblebee species are facing some degree of threat or extinction risk, um, according to the criteria that's set by the IUCN. Um, so bumblebees are of conservation concern. And they're also a lot easier to survey than other bees. Bumblebees are a lot bigger than a lot of our other native bees, uh, which makes them easier to find. Um, as you can see from this photo here in the bottom left corner, um, that bumblebee compared to this other native bee um, is quite a lot bigger. Um, and that larger size also makes them a lot easier to photograph. Um, bumblebees are also one of the only species of bees that can be confidently identified from just photos. Um, 
there are certain characteristics that can only be seen um, through a microscope or with a hand lens, um, but bumblebees can be ID'd from just photos alone as opposed to a lot of our other uh, species of native bees. Um, and we already have some historic records of, of bumblebees, um, but doing surveys is helping us gather a lot more data to understand more about the distribution of different species and how different species are doing. So the Minnesota bumblebee atlas is just one piece of this uh, bumblebee atlas as a whole. Uh, so this we partner with the Xerxes Society on this project. Um, so there are bumblebee atlas projects in other parts of the country as well, including the Pacific Northwest, Missouri, Nebraska, California, North and South Dakota, and then new this year are the Southeast and Iowa. Um, and eventually we will be merging into a Midwest Bumblebee Atlas. Um, so our website will look a little bit different. Um, some of these trainings might look a little bit different, but we're going to keep you all in the loop as that merger um, happens. Um, so this is just the front page of our website. So everything that I'm going over today, uh, we will, or is available there, um, the videos, um, other training information, um, all of the data sheets and stuff like that is all available there. Um, but um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the Atlas is um, a community science project. So all of our data is gathered by volunteers. Everybody is welcome to participate. Um, and it's been a lot of fun for everybody that's been involved so far. So moving into just touch on some of our 2021 and 2022 Bumblebee Atlas accomplishments. So between 2021 and 2022, uh, 49 grids have been adopted. So there's 40 grids left uh, that need to be adopted to have total coverage of the entire state. Um, this is our most updated version of our map. Uh, so the purple cells are the ones that are high priority. Gray cells are lower priority, and then the green cells are the ones where you need to have a recovery permit from the Fish and Wildlife Service to do surveys. So between 2021 and 2022, there are almost 7,000 bumblebee sightings that were uploaded to Bumblebee Watch. Um, and a lot of, we took all of this data and it is included in on the project highlights tab of our website. We have a report that we created last year um, that uh, talks about some of our key findings and what they mean for conservation. Uh, so in 2021 and 2022, um, we identified 18 out of our 25 species of bumblebees. And this includes four species of notable conservation concern, including Bombus affinis, which is the rusty patch bumblebee, uh, which is a critically endangered species, along with Bombus fervidus, the yellow bumblebee, Bombus pennsylvanicus, the American bumblebee, and uh, Bombus terricola, which I, I can't remember the common name for that one. Um, but those are other species of um, conservation concern here in Minnesota. So what are the requirements for participating in the Atlas? Uh, you need to have time. So we require a minimum of two surveys per year. Uh, we'd love it if you can get out and do three, uh, but we understand that time can be a limiting factor sometimes. Um, but each survey requires um, about two, two to three, maybe four hours uh, per survey. You need to have reliable transportation out to your survey site. Um, a lot of the survey sites can sometimes be a little bit remote, so you need to make sure you have safe access to and from your survey site. Um, you need to have a camera, uh, preferably one with a macro lens if you can. A lot of our volunteers um, have been able to get away with just using their phones. Um, some folks have bigger, really fancy, nice cameras that always produce really awesome bumblebee photos, but we're not asking you to go out and buy a camera if you don't have one. Um, Cell phones or iPhone cameras, Android cameras have worked fine in the last couple of years. Um, and there's apps you can download um, to make your photos even better. And I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to pop in for a second because I have this sitting right here. Elaine, you're muted. Sorry, popping in for a second because I have my camera right here <laughs> that I like using. Um, that there there are some some point and shoots that are you know not super expensive 
really easy to use, but they have a feature called a microscope function. So this is uh, an Olympus one, um, Olympus Tough. I think Canon makes one as well. Um, and they're, they, this is pretty nice to be able to get those, those close-up shots. It has a, a ring light, which helps with the, with the lighting of stuff close up. So, um, so this is, this is one that we, you know, that we can, can recommend if you do want to get something besides the phone, but you're not, um, ready to, be, to go up to that kind of professional level, um, digital camera. Um, and then the final requirement um, is you need reliable internet access as all of these Bumblebee observations get uploaded to Bumblebee Watch. So how to participate. I know that a handful of you have already adopted grids. I'm sure there's some people in here that are just curious about how the, um, the survey process goes. Uh, but the first step is signing up on the Bumblebee Watch website. So you have to make an account um, with Bumblebee Watch at bumblebeewatch.org. Then you move over to our website, um, our Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas site, uh, where you can fill out the form to adopt a grid cell. Um, so like I mentioned before, the purple uh, cells are the ones that are high priority, uh, so we don't have as much data in those areas. Um, the gray cells are the ones that are lower priority, so we already have a handful of information there, but always appreciate more data and more photos. And then the ones that are in uh, this corner of the state, um, these green cells are the ones that require a recovery permit from the Fish and Wildlife Service um, to do surveys. Um, so you'll fill out our adopt a grid cell form uh, with the cell that you would select like to conduct your surveys in. And then you gotta start, start the preparation process. So this includes training. Uh, so this is our first online training uh, for the 2023 season. Um, we will have, we've got, I've got dates listed at the end of this presentation of our other upcoming trainings. We've got um, a couple that are happening in person um, and we will we'll have a couple others that will be scheduled um, online. And this will be recorded and posted to our training page as well. So if you have any questions and want to refer back, um, this video will always be here for you. Uh, you'll need to gather together your supplies. So this includes vials uh, for capturing bees in, um, a net. Uh, I prefer to, when I'm doing a bubble bee survey, to just collect them directly through direct capture into a cup uh, rather than using a net. But some folks prefer to use a net. Um, you need a cooler. Uh, this is what you use to, to chill the bees down so you can take photos of them. And then you'll need your data sheets. Um, we've condensed our data sheet from last year. We had two last year. We've condensed it all into one. Uh, so the bumblebee data and the habitat data is all in uh, one data sheet as opposed to two. Uh, you'll want to make a plan before you go out to your grid cell. You'll want to have a location chosen ahead of time. Um, and then I know I've seen a handful of your names in our private Facebook group, but we have a private Facebook group for folks to um, interact with one another, ask any questions, um, share cool things that they've been finding. And it's a place that Elaine and I use to um, post updates and reminders of upcoming trainings and events and things like that. So something new that we've added to our map this year is um, another layer that uh, includes public land. So these green patches um, that are included all across the map, it's, they're definitely a little bit easier to see uh, when you're able to zoom in. Uh, these are all public lands. So these are all areas that you should be able to go um, and do surveys without worrying about trespassing on somebody else's property. Um, and it kind of gives you an idea of, of areas within your grid cell that could be appropriate for, uh, for surveys. I think that um, state parks and SNAs are lists are included in this layer of the map with the public lands. Um, but those areas you do need a permit uh, to conduct surveys in. Uh, we're in the process of applying for a permit to do surveys in certain uh, state parks and SNAs, which we will share with everybody once that has been approved. Um, the, there are also wildlife management areas that are included um, in uh, the, the public lands areas. And those areas, uh, you are free to do surveys and you just need to contact the manager of that wildlife management area. Um, before doing a survey there. Uh, so we have a new trespassing policy this year. Um, 
from Xerxes Society. So we want folks to be very, very cautious uh, when you're going out to do your surveys that you're not trespassing on private land. Uh, so when you're at the site, make sure you're carefully looking for any markers that are indicating uh, that it's someone's uh, private land. Um, if you do happen to find yourself on a private property without permission, um, or if you've been asked to leave, please leave immediately. Um, even if your uh, survey is not complete. Um, uh, so this, another thing we have this year that we've sent out are um, these uh, lanyards or badges that um, folks can um, request uh, that says Bumblebee Survey Volunteer. Um, so this will kind of give people an idea of what you're doing when you're out there. Um, but even when you're wearing that, that does not mean that you have um, permit or permission to go onto any of uh, any private lands. And, and sorry, Elise, just to bust in for another second. Uh -huh. um, we're, are we, we still, I think, are, are we still, if people want to get one of those lanyards, they can still sign up? Is that right? I believe so. And we might have to double check on that though. I thought it was end of May, but I could, I could be wrong. Yeah, so we can we can make sure we share that information with people about that for those that are interested. Yep. All right. Uh, so just touching on some some good general questions that we get. Uh, so what makes for a good survey spot? Spring flowers like plum trees, marsh marigolds, gooseberry, woodland plants, or big patches of fall plants, or roadside plantings of native plants. So any good survey site will have lots of flowers, um, particularly in the month of July. Um, another common question is what is a good way to find a survey site ahead of time when the survey area is an hour or more away from where we live? So there are a couple things you can do in this instance. You wanna look for places you can access. Uh, you can go ahead and use our public lands map uh, to look at some areas that might be free for surveying um, in your grid cell. Uh, you can take a look on Google Maps as well uh, for any parks or open looking areas that might um, have, have uh, flowering plants there. Um, and if it's possible, uh, you can take a separate trip to, to kind of scout out your area or plan for an extra hour uh, on your first survey site to know that you're finding a good spot. You want to have this kind of planned out ahead of time um, because it would be a bummer to show up to do your surveys only to discover that there are no flowers uh, in your grid cell or in the particular area that you're looking. So how do we actually survey? How do we actually go about gathering data? So capturing Bumblebee data um, is done in a 45 minute uh, survey. Uh, so you're spending 45 minutes capturing bees. Um, and, and this 45 minutes is just the time that is spent looking for bees and capturing them. So um, once you've got some bees in your cooler, you might wanna pause your timer and take uh, some photographs of them. So the time that you spend photographing the bees and uploading those photographs to uh, Bumblebee Watch um, doesn't count towards that 45 minute time chunk of your survey. So as you're capturing bees, uh, you'll wanna note the flowers that you're collecting them from. Um, uh, sometimes it can help when you uh, capture the bee. So like I mentioned, I prefer to capture the bees directly into uh, the vial or container um, while I'm doing a survey. Sometimes it can help to get a piece of that flower actually in the cup so you know um, the species of flower that um, that bee was on. Um, it can also help to kind of keep a list as you're going. So if you're if you're labeling your vials, uh, you, the first bee you collect might be um, number one. So you'd put a number one on the outside of the vial and then um, either keeping track on your phone or on a, on a list on a piece of paper, um, write down number one and then the type of plant or flower that you collected that bee from. So you want to make sure you're keeping track of that as you're going as well um, because that can easily get confusing when you go to take photos and then upload that information. So once you've captured the bees, you'll want to put them into uh, your cooler on ice. And um, this pretty much just puts the bees to sleep. It slows them down a lot uh, so you can get uh, really good photographs. So you'll want to take photos of um, the sides from the top um, and you'll want to get photos of the face as well. So photos of the bees from many different angles. Um, I think you can upload five images per bee onto Bumblebee Watch. 
Um, and once you've gotten those photographs, you can go ahead and release the bumblebees. Uh, so this is a catch and release project. We're not um, harming or killing any specimens for this project. Um, so like I mentioned earlier with our data sheets, part of it is for bumblebee data and the other part is the habitat data. So we have a habitat assessment form uh, so you can kind of assess your site location um, and take some notes um, and answer the questions on that data sheet about what's in the surrounding habitat so we can get a better idea of, of where your survey is and, and where you're at. So here is just a really quick clip of how to capture a bumblebee into a vial, just like that. So these, these vials can sometimes be a little bit harder to work with, the ones that have the, um, where the lid is attached uh, to the rest of the vial. Um, Elaine and I often use um, urine sample cups to, to capture bees. Um, we also have a handful of like really the small size of Tupperware containers. Uh, those tend to work fairly well. Um, as well for catching bees. I believe we also have a, a video from last season up on our online training page on our website um, about where we talk a little bit more in depth about how to catch bees. Um, so yep, so then all of those photos and all the information on your data sheets will then get uploaded to Bumblebee Watch. Uh, Bumblebee Watch also has a page uh, with some photo tips that can can give you some pointers in terms of taking photos of bees. So another common question, um, if someone helps by just taking pictures but not capturing bees, does that count as a second person? So the answer to this is no. So additional people only count for the time that is spent collecting bees because we want to have consistent survey effort. Uh, so you, if you have two people that are participating in uh, your survey, uh, you'll take 45 minutes divided by two, and that's um, the amount of time that you will spend then looking for bees between, between the two of you. So essentially, the number of people, um, however many minutes each person is surveying, that should add up to a total of 45 minutes. Um, so once all of your data is gathered, all your you got all your photos, your location information, uh, the flowers your bees were collected from, um, and the habitat data, you want to upload all of that into Bumblebee Watch. So you'll go into record a sighting, uh, Bumblebee sighting, and then you can say that you're part of the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas project to put in your data there. Um, you'll enter all of this information, um, and you will also include the number of hours that you spent uh, conducting your survey, but this also includes the time that you spent driving out to your site, uh, the time you spent at your survey site, so the 45 minute time, plus however many minutes it took you to um, get your photo photographs and uh, the habitat data assessment, um, and the amount of time that it took you uh, to upload the information to Bumblebee Watch. So then once, once you've done your first survey, uh, you'll want to go ahead and repeat the process. So like I mentioned before, um, we really prefer uh, three surveys, but understand that some folks can only meet the minimum of two. Uh, surveys happen between mid-June and mid-August, but this is dependent on the weather. Uh, so this year is a little bit weird, like last year was. We had a really late spring last year because it, we had a lot of wet, cold uh, weather, and we had to wait until late June to really get started with our surveys. Um, and, and this, the bumblebee survey season can kind of sync up sometimes with when bee balm is blooming. Um, when you're repeating going out for your second and third survey, you can, you're welcome to go to the same location that you went to the first time, or you can pick a different location within that same grid cell you've been assigned to. So this video uh, will be posted up to our online training page. Uh, we've got some other videos up there as well. We did um, a video about a month ago uh, with a lot more information on bumblebee ecology and conservation. If you'd like to refer back to that, if you're curious about some more uh, bumblebee ecology basics, um, we will. We have another video up there currently about specifically about the rusty patch bumblebee uh, for folks who um, are in high potential zones, uh, potentially encountering the rusty patch bumblebee, and what to do if you find that species. Um, so we've got a video up there. We intend to do another training. Uh, for that as well uh, sometime in June. 
Um, yeah, but so you can refer back to our online training page at any time. This video will be posted there. Uh, so hopefully that will be able to answer any of your questions that you that come along um, as you're going through your surveys. So here's a list of some of our future trainings. Um, Elaine and I will be at Jay Cook State Park on Tuesday. Um, there, I, I'm not sure what's, if there are still registration spots open because that course is a little bit limited, um, but if anybody's interested in that, um, those links are posted on our website. Um, and that is focused primarily on Bumblebee ID. Um, next Saturday, we'll be at the Gathering Partners Conference at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum doing another um, in-person presentation, kind of talking about uh, the Bumblebee Atlas uh, protocols, some general uh, bumblebee ecology and conservation information, and then some more about Bumblebee ID. Um, and then in early June, we will be down in Faribault doing another um, in-person training. Um, and we will, I mean, for those, so for those of you that are on our Facebook page, we'll be posting updates and reminders as these are approaching um, and any information about new trainings uh, that we decide to host as well. Uh, so we'll take some questions now about um, Bumblebee Atlas protocols, and then we'll take a really short break. So feel free to unmute, ask your questions, or yeah. um, there were also a couple questions in the in the chat that um, I thought might be easier to address <laughs> with um, with talking about them. Um, so there was. Um, one question that I was wanting a little bit of clarification on. So um, for from Anya, you were asking about um, what does it take to get a permit? Can you clarify what kind of permit you were <laughs> you're talking about? <laughs> because we have different things. We have you know uh, permits to be in the in the state park or permits for the rusty patch bumblebee. Oh yeah, so you want to uh, to adopt a cell with the with the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, so so that is is a bit um, a bit of a process. So you would need to get apply for a recovery permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and um, basically you need to to take some some. Bumblebee ID training, which we do have training as, as part of this course that I believe would be sufficient for that. So that's something that you could, could say you had ID training through, through this class. We also offer a, a more elaborate Bumblebee ID class that um, is going to be available as an asynchronous online course. And that's, you know, that's more like a six hour course that covers everything about all the Midwest bumblebees. Um, so more than you need for the permit, but, um, but it does take time. So, you know, you need to explain what you're doing, why you're doing it. Um, and you'd be unlikely to be able to get that through for this year. Um, if you're starting that process now, because um, it does take um, you know, usually like three or more months to get that um, permit approved. You need, you know, a couple letters of reference, um, which if you if you were taking this class, I could be one of the, the references for you, just um, asserting that you know how to do some identification. Um, so it's, it's a process, but it is possible. Um, but Probably not for this year. The um, the other option, if you want to survey within the the green areas, is um, to just do photo only, where you're not capturing bees, because it's just recommended to not um, not capture um, capture rusty patch bumblebees because of of, of possible risk. Um, so it is. There have been other volunteers that just did photo only surveys. Um, and, and it's it's harder to, to have that fit into the exact protocols, but you can still take photos, up them, um, upload them to Bumblebee Watch and, and you know, increase our, our records for, for those areas. Uh, thanks. Um, I'd be willing to put in the work um, to do it for next year. Um, I'm also a, I'm a PhD ecologist, so kind of used to permits and things like that. So yeah, I, yeah that I, helps. Yeah, I totally willing. And I have rusty patch bumblebees in my front yard. So <laughs> I have experience identifying them too and handling wild animals and things like that. So 
love to give it a shot. Yeah, um, so I can I can put a link in there. There there are links on the the you know the Fish and Wildlife Service has has information about you know the the permit applications. Great, thanks. Yeah, um, Kathy. Did... Yeah, yeah. On the first time I did the surveys, and then I you know did everything, and I was uh, down south of Albert Lee, and then I was ready to put in my data. And to my surprise, I also needed to. Um, name all the flowers and their Latin name that I had seen. Um, can you guys, which, you know, was fine. I think I spent more time doing that than um, doing the the bumblebee part of it, I assume. And, and I know it's part of the ecology, you know, and these were flowers, there weren't bumblebees on. So there'd be like 10 or 15, not uh, bump, uh, flowers blooming that the bumblebees weren't on and maybe you know, because uh, I didn't see that many bumblebees, just, you know, five five flowers down there. And also just to, if you're looking for rusty patch bumblebees, um, even though it's a purple grid, I did see one rusty patch bumblebee. So <laughs> you can think of it that way too, if you want to help look for rusty patches, other purple grids might have them. Nobody had looked for a long time, I think, down there. So, but what, what, what can you, t and, and then what I do now is I'll do a walkthrough of an area um, just to see where the bumblebees are, if there even are any, to know if I even want to uh, do a capture. And while I'm doing that walkthrough, I'll take a bunch of pictures of all the different flowers. And then I learned stuff by trying to figure out what they are. Sometimes I'll use PlantNet, you know, the app, but even then, you know, it's not always for sure what it is. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point, Kathy. And it is, um, I, it is nice if you, especially if you're going to an area that you're not familiar with, if you can scout it out ahead of time to see kind of, you know, what's, what's going on there, find the good spots. Um, you know, we do, um, you know, we do want to know just what's going on with bumblebees. So there may be some sites that don't have a ton of bumblebees bumblebees there, but we still would love to have the information about what's going on with them. It can be not as fun of a survey, but um, even if there are kind of low abundances, we'll be learning about the habitat associations and all that kind of stuff. But, but scouting out ahead of time does help. Um, there is definitely a learning curve with, with the plants. Um, and you know the, the the most important plants to get to 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 get ID'd um, are the ones that you're collecting the bumblebees from. Um, but we do, yeah, we do like to collect that information on just anything that's blooming in the area, so we have that information as well. And um, yeah, I mean, um, Kathy mentioned the the PlantNet app. Um, people also will use iNaturalist. Um, there's the um, sometimes I just as as uh, so so you know with iNaturalist you can take a photo, upload it, and there's other people that can help you with identifying it. You know the PlantNet does the kind of you know AI um, best guess, which is um, can help get you close. Not always reliable. Um, I naturalist, there's usually a good number of people on there who who know what they're know what they're doing enough that you can can um, track down what the plants are. There is um, the the website minnesotawildflowers.org um, has great ID information if you're especially if you're getting stuff narrowed down and you need to figure out between a couple different plants. They'll have um, it's all Minnesota plants and they'll um, they'll have the things they'll, they'll they'll list out the features you need to look at um, but you might not if you don't have time to do that all out in the field you can um, just make sure you're taking good pictures of the photos which we talk about how to take good with good photos of the bees but we don't necessarily talk about that for the flowers um, that's something we should should add in here but it does help to get you know pictures not just of the flower but also the leaves and sometimes there's um, leaves upper light leaves and then basal leaves that are that are different and can help you know the arrangement of the leaves on the stem so taking a few pictures of the flowers um, and and making note of you know what that flower is in your field note so you can um, ID it later and um, you know we're we're always happy to help too um, <laughs> if you're if you're stuck on what something is um, 
and and we also have a bunch of coworkers um, in the B lab that are that are plant nerds. So yes. they're they're <laughs> yeah they're always happy to to look at pictures of flowers and and try to figure out what they are. Mm -hmm. Um, I see a question in the chat from Hannah. Uh, do we need to have a permit on hand to collect from DNR land? Uh, do you send them out to us? We discussed Greenleaf State Park. Okay, so I have submitted our request uh, for a, I think it's just like a general research permit um, is the type of permit we request um, that covers all of our volunteers across a handful of different state parks and SNAs that people had requested. Um, Last year, I don't, we didn't have any issues with getting that um, approved, but I know that these things sometimes take time. Uh, so we're just waiting to hear back to get that permit. But once that comes back, I'll send an email out um, to everybody uh, with the details of the permit. Um, so you should have that information um, as soon as we have that information. But yes, you do need to have the permit to um, do a bumblebee survey um, on DNR land. And there is a question back up a little ways that I left to about um, changing entries in in Bumblebee Watch. If you you know misidentified a plant and you want to go back and correct it, you should be able to go in and edit your your finding your 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 entries there. Um, I know um, I've at least done that with um, with you know latitude longitude where all of a sudden where you know I found was looking at, at uh, records and all of a sudden someone was in Mongolia and, you know, it's like, okay, you forgot to put the, the minus sign in front of, of the, uh, you know, the, the longitude. So, <laughs> yes. so we should be able to, to update any of those entries there after, after the fact. Mm -hmm. Um. So another question, is the iNaturalist Minnesota Bee Atlas project still being utilized? Lynn, you might be able to speak to this one better than me. Yeah, so um, so that is um, still collecting entries. So um, so so there was a, a previous version of this bumblebee atlas that was also connected with a larger bee atlas project. And as part of that, we were just collecting um, iNaturalist records of bees across Minnesota. And we do still have that, that project set, set up to just anybody that's submitting bee IDs in Minnesota goes into this, this record in um, iNaturalist in that, in that project. Um, the, and, and there also still um, are some, there was a, a tunnel nesting study as part of that, which is continuing on in a, in a different form. But the, that iNaturalist project, any, anything that you put in there kind of um, probably for mostly, for mostly forever will <laughs> be going into those records. Um, I see another question. If I was a volunteer last year, do I need to apply for my same grid as last year once again? Yes. So every year that you want to participate in the Bumblebee Atlas, you do need to fill out the adopt a grid form. Um, even if you're doing the same grid cell, you just need to do it um, every year to, so we can update our records. And I, I know we have a, a yeah a few people on here who've who've done the surveys in previous years. So um, if you have any other insights to share, feel free to to unmute or type it in the chat. <laughs> Or tell people how fun it is. <laughs> so I was one who did the um, the routes a few years ago, three years, and this seems better because you have a broader area to search in. Because I think when I did the routes, I was often in between a cornfield and a soybean field with no flowers in sight, um, and on a road, so you just didn't feel that great. So this seems like it's better because you can choose where you want to go and have bigger opportunities to find a bunch of flowers. So I can see the advantage of this. So if I just looked at the grid and it's an awfully big area. <laughs> yeah, you should be able to find something that works. So so in our in our the first five years we were doing these statewide bumblebee surveys, we were using 
breeding bird atlas routes. And part of that was, um, you know, there's there's a lot of history with, with studies that have been done along those routes. And, you know, we weren't sure how difficult it would be for people to be able to find places to survey. I was a little bit worried about that. So I figured these breeding bird atlas routes, they're in, in you know, public roadsides, we didn't need to worry about people figuring out permits or anything like that. Um, but it did definitely limit some of the things we were able to talk about with habitat. So, um, you know, most of the things we saw are like, well, we're seeing this in roadsides, which is which is important information. But with with um, with the, this grid approach, and over the last few years, people have been able to 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 find places. So so that worry has been allayed, um, and uh, and and definitely learning more about kind of the the broader situation for for bumblebees just in in um in different habitats um so someone is asking if we send vials or if it's up to you to find something suitable and um, that that is something that that you're responsible for so um so yeah you're you're responsible for your so we for for the the vials having a cooler or something to, to cool the bees down with, you know, the, the camera. Um, but the, the vials are, um, are pretty flexible with what you can, can use. Um, you know, so we, we do just cause they're, they're cheap and easy to find. We do use those kind of urine, urine specimen cups a lot, but there's also, you know, little kind of Tupperware things you can get from the grocery stores that, that work well. Um, and, you know, it helps to have, a, a couple dozen of them to be able to, to stick bees in there and do, do them kind of in a batch before you move on. Um, but if, um, I just want to say also, if, if any of the equipment or anything like that is limiting for you to be able to, to do this, just please reach out to us and we'll, we'll do what we can to help facilitate, um, facilitate this for you. So if you have difficulty tracking down or if it's or if it's just um, an impediment for you, please just just let us know. Are we taking pictures through the vials or taking pictures of the bee once it's cooled down and you take it out of the vial? The the best photos tend to be when they're they're cooled down enough to where they you know they they pass out a bit and you can take the photo um, just of the bee out of the vial. Um, and, and some of the, the taking photos through the vials depends on what you get for your containers. So there are some very clear containers that, um, photos through, through the containers work well. Um, and, and, um, others where it's just cloudy and blurry and, and doesn't work. Um, there also are some bees, some of the larger bees, it takes them a really long time to cool down. Um, so, so sometimes I'd like to at least have one clear container that I can, can um, try to photo through if, um, if they're just, if I, if, if there's going to be bees that just don't cool down. Yeah, and what Miss Kathy, what, what uh, this will be my third year, I think, doing this, and I, I'm getting to parts of Minnesota that I don't know a whole lot about. Um, that I chose grids in southern Minnesota, so that's interesting to me and see how agriculture uh, interacts with all the wildlife management areas um, that are down there and a few different flowers. And then I'm a bird watcher, so I'm getting to see some of the prairie birds. Um, even if I don't see bumblebees, and then there's always a meadow lark or something, uh, dick thistles down there. Um, so, and I'm hoping to add in a trip to northern Iowa, get my husband to come with me, um, because it does, as I move farther southwest, it does take a while to get down there and get back. So it's, I'm retired, but, you know, it still um, becomes more of a, an all-day thing. So I'm, I'm going to try to do that. And then, then I, I'm learning I'm back into tall grass prairies, which I don't see here on the east side of St. Paul. Um, and the bumblebees seem to be acting differently. So, and then I worry that I'm gonna harm the, the bumblebees. Um, and, but so far, every single one that I've cooled down um, has flown away. You know, I'll put it under a plant in the shade 
kind of keep an eye on it. And um, even though that the weather is so variable and they can get humid and look kind of wet and, and I go, oh no, you know, what have I done? But they're pretty hardy and, and, and fly away. In fact, I would say one out of three that I capture, I think it's cooled down, but as soon as I open the lid, and it's always hot by the, some, you know, the time I get all this stuff done and then a one out of three will fly away <laughs> So before I get a good picture. So then I'll try to take pictures through whatever container first and, you know, and then try to take a better picture in the sun. But yeah, but yeah. I just don't worry That's about nice. that. <laughs> And I'd, I'd say also, you know, just just in terms of, of keeping the bees safe, as long as you're um, just keeping them out of direct sun. So, um, you know, if you have them in vials, just make sure you're not setting the vials out in direct sun. Um, you know, if you have them out of the cooler, making sure that they're in the shade. And when you leave them to, to wake up, just, just leaving them in the shade, um, that kind of overheating seems to be be the issue. And if you are using, um, if you do have vials that you have um, put holes into, if you have them in the cooler, making sure that they are not getting down into where the ice is melting and could get um, wet down there. So they do usually, you know, unless it's exceptionally hot, um, they'll usually be fine in those, in uh, just a sealed container, they have enough air um, for, for, you know, 10 minutes in the, in the cooler or whatever it might be. Um, but, um, yeah, just be extra careful if you do have holes in your containers that you, um, keep them away from, from pooled up water. And, uh, Gwendolyn, do you want to, uh, ask your question? Hi, everybody. Um, a little bit of background information. I am Gwen. Please call me Gwen. Oh, thank you. Uh, I am. <laughs> I have been sort of a, a wonderful, blessed situation, but and I have a bird in the room that hears other voices and wants to talk. Um, but uh, but also a problem. Um, I got to move to Minnesota, which is where I've dreamed of living all my life, from Southwest Ohio, during the pandemic, and I'm interested in bees now because. Minnesota master naturalist and Amy Rager and stuff made the mistake of giving of helping me get into two master naturalist classes and I'm allergic to bees and <laughs> not badly not deadly okay a little bit allergic but I am in this class because Britt Forsberg and just really inspired me um so I have two questions first of all um I I this is probably going to be my learning season and really really do basic stuff I am near Shakopee, I'm in Scott County, and but I have an emergency relocation in process and I'm going to hopefully be going to Duluth uh, in July or August. So, um, you know, I, two, the two questions are, first of all, um, I am gonna look for a grid between here and Duluth, of course, but more importantly, is there some basic, I mean, just some basic, you know, general kind of, ridiculously simple oversights I might make as somebody that it's just going to get a little itch or a little nauseated if I get, you know, if I get stung or get into a bad position. <laughs> I mean, is there, I, because I don't, you know, there, there are stigmas out there, you know, that bees can smell fear or the, the, whatever. And I'm less afraid than ever. And, and I'm here because I'm excited because I've learned so much about them. But on the other hand, I might make stupid mistakes. Um, any experience, strength, and hope uh, would be really appreciated. Great, yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for asking this. So it, it is um, something that um, for, for, the, for the most part with, with bumblebees, they're really protective when, they're, when you're near their nest. And, and the problem is it it's can be hard to know where the nests are. So, you know, you could be in a situation where you're walking around to the flowers and you end up near a bumblebee nest. Um, it varies a lot with the different species. So there's some, a lot of bumblebee species where even if you, you know, Lisa mentioned, sometimes we, we go and take nests. There's some species where I just walk up to the nest with bare hands and pick it up and put it in a box and they don't, nobody <laughs> bothers me at all. Um, but it is, um, you know, for, for these protocols in general, um, it, it should be pretty 
low risk of of stinging. So, um, you know, this we've been doing this for for quite a while. I mean, and I've been doing similar things for, uh, yeah, fifteen years with with volunteers, and um, very rarely have you know the bees. <laughs> you know, you can never say never with anything. So, you know. 99.9% .9 of the time the bees wake up and they, they fly away, you know, like I think two out of 20,000 bees have woken up and then tried to fly around and get to me. So it's, it's you know, so I can't, you know, <laughs> um, but even in that case, you know, um, just kind of being aware, you know, watching the bees for their, for their mood. Um, it, you know, even if they do come flying at you, usually if you're able to just walk away, even just, you know, 10 feet, usually, um, you know, you're just near their nest. They just want to protect their nest. Um, but um, it's, it's good advice, especially if you, if you, you know, are, are concerned um, to, if, if it's possible to have someone else with you. So um, I know it's not always possible for everybody to coordinate that, but in general, especially anybody who's going out to remote areas, especially making sure you at least are checking in with people. You have somebody who, who knows where you're going and knows when to expect you back. Um, but if you are able to, to have somebody come with you, that's really kind of the, the best way to, to ensure that, that <laughs> things will be okay. I am lucky. I was a uh, Ohio and a South Carolina EMT. Uh, and I and I don't need an EpiPen or anything. I know to bring plenty of hydration and stuff. But I also don't know any men yet in Minnesota. Uh, and my strength is my photography has been National Geographic. And uh, so photography is my big my, and I'm a trauma survivor. Photography lets me know that there are beautiful triumphs and things in the world. So uh, I bring that and a lot of patience and a great attention to, the, to detail. So like I said, um, Britt's responsible for me being so, like, so curious. And in fact, I, I actually came upon a nest in a residential area, or at least a, 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 some bees swarming around a queen on the ground um, a couple of days ago. And people didn't and I had to let somebody on, on the residential property know it's a multi-residence apartment complex. And I said, just in case, and I went, oh, they never get on the ground. And I'm like, you have no clue. <laughs> uh, the, the training this morning has been really, really validating that, yeah, they're they're on the ground. They are underneath. We, you know, I, I was born in a snowstorm in Ohio, so I did come here as opposed to Florida for the cool temperatures and, and the bees you know, are underground and people don't understand that, um, yeah, this is a big time for them and they're going to find them on their ankles and, and down at that level. So uh, this is validating my experience. Thanks yeah, so much. If everybody. anybody needs somebody to be that kind of field check person, if you need to just like, let somebody know I'm going here at these times and, and checking in contact Elise or mm -hmm. I, or, or me, you know, and, and, and let us know and, and we can, can try to and I just I just yeah. asked for membership to the Facebook group so I, I'm pretty sure that it's small enough that we could even just say hey I'm going out that direction this morning or something so thanks guys yeah thanks Gwen mm. all right hopefully we can get these last two questions and then I think we're going to need to make sure we have time for a little bit of a break and time for for ID which I know yep. I'm, I'm sure people are excited about as well right. so do you want to go ahead Nicole I actually don't have a question. I was going to say, it. so I posted a link for these vials in on Amazon. Um, and they're really cool, actually. I use them for dragonflies because I've been doing dragonfly surveying for the last three years. Um, but they have, now don't put the bees in the vial and put them in the sun at all, ever, because they will die. I had, had an unfortunate thing with the key zone kids that I it, it would did not make it. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, vial in the heat, not good plan. Sorry, you guys. Um, but anyway, they also have a grid on the bottom of them. So if you want it, so if you take a picture, what I would do is I, I would put them in the cooler, put the bee in them, put them in the cooler. And then what you can do is you can put your camera or your phone right over the top of the, it comes with the lid and you can take the lid off, put your camera or your phone right over the top of the lid. And then you can get a picture. And with the grid on the bottom, you can get some idea of the size. 
So uh, it was a really good trick for dragonflies because they were a consistent size. And so I could get a measure of the size of the dragonfly based on pretty much how, how much they filled out the, the bug box that I started calling them. But those, have worked, those worked really well for storing insects because they do have air holes in the butt. They're made for kids to go out and collect bugs. So they will survive just fine in those and they're easy to use. Yeah, thanks so for sharing. I just want that worked for me well, but just, just don't put them in the just don't we just be careful of the heat factor. <laughs> hey, Teresa. Oh, I, I just have a really I have a quick question about the grids. Um, before the Oops, I'm having that, trouble hearing. Okay, can you hear me at all? Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I have a question about the grids. Before the, I was at that last workshop, and right before it, I applied for a grid in Duluth, and it was um, let me see if I can. Oh, here it is. Um, it was either 50 or 58, and I was able, when you apply for it, it was open for application and it was green, and I haven't received an email, and they're both gray right now, and if somebody else has applied for them, that's fine, but I need, I don't know how to see if I, if it's, if, if my name is on it. Yeah, so we, we can take multiple people within a grid, mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't know, at least maybe you can talk about the communication stuff. Yeah, so once um, we, so all of the, our form is linked to a spreadsheet, so I'll get a notification. Uh, once you fill out that adopt a grid cell form, and then I'll send you an email from our Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas email, um, confirming uh, that grid uh, with uh, some, an update on our, our trainings and stuff like that. Um, so I can take a look after this meeting, Teresa. Um, okay. For that request and, okay. and get back to you. So then, if I'm not on it yet, I would be on it. You would put me on it, or would yes. I have to? Okay, okay. See, so, yeah, we. I mean, if you're if you haven't, um, if you're already on it, I I, I want to say that I've seen your name on our on our list for this year, but I'm I'm not positive. Um, but but I can I'll make sure to connect with you so we can we can check in about that. Okay, thank you. All right. Um. So just so that I, we make sure that we have some time to go over some of this ID stuff to prep you um, for, for getting out there and seeing the bees. Um, why don't we take a, can we take a seven minute break <laughs> and meet back here at, um, at, at 1050 to, to go into the next section. Sounds good. All right, so yeah, buy a little bio break. All right, we're at 10.50, so I'm gonna start up on this, on this next section. So um, the goal with this section is to give you an an overview of, of the bumblebees, um, concentrating on, um, first off, some of the common ones that you're gonna be running into, as well as just what end up being kind of tricky pairs with a focus on if you're taking photos for us to ID, what features we need to see to be able to, to pick them apart. Um, so, you know, we end up looking at a lot of, of photos of, of bumblebees and um, it's it's great to look at, at pretty pictures of bumblebees, but you can even have a blurry, <laughs> not great photo. And as long as we can just see the ID features that we need to see, that that's all we really need. Um, so I, um, I mostly take not great pictures of bumblebees. <laughs> Once in a while, I take a good one, but um, but don't don't worry about being able to um, you know it, 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 we we love seeing the beautiful pictures of bumblebees, but that's not what you need to do for this project. We need to be able to to just identify them. So um, so yeah, I'm gonna launch into this next section here to start talking about our um our bumblebees so um elaine we're seeing your browser with the bumblebee oh, id card oh, okay <laughs> thank you even though it says it's that i will just reshare because 
It should be this. Okay, now it's showing me that it's that. Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. <laughs> In um, throughout much of the, the Midwest, there are three species that account usually account for about 80% of the population. So this does vary. You see different bees up, up in northern Minnesota in particular, but um, these are three that are good to be familiar with because um, you're probably gonna be seeing a lot of them. So the impatiens is the common Eastern bumblebee, bimaculatus is the two-spotted bumblebee, and griseocolis is the brown-belted bumblebee. Um, I also just want to make sure that everybody knows about um, this resource here, which is our um, guide to Minnesota bumblebees. So it's a, a two-sided PDF, two-sided document where one side is females, one side is, is male. Oh, wait, before I do this, you need to do the, the other thing, Elise. I forgot. Back up. Before we move into these, we're going to talk about how do you tell if it's a bumblebee. Sorry for a moment of confusion there. <laughs> So um, on Bumblebee Watch, we do from time to time get a handful of observations that are actually not bumblebees. Um, so this is a little bit of a trick question here um, because none of these photos are bees. So there are a lot of uh, different species of pollinators or insects that um, mimic uh, different types of bees, honeybees. Um, and bumblebees included. Um, and a lot of these insects are actually flies. Um, so here's an example of one. So this is a fly that is mimicking a bumblebee. This is a bumblebee lookalike. Um, and there are a couple ways that we can know that it's a fly and not a bumblebee. Um, so the antenna um, are variable on the different types of flies, but they're often really, really short um, and a lot stubbier than what you would see on a bumblebee or other type of bee. Um, flies also don't have pollen baskets on their hind legs um, since they are not bees. Um, they also only have one pair of wings, whereas bumblebees um, have two pairs of wings. Um, they have short, blunt mouths. Um, and one other thing too is that they have uh, these, these large eyes. So we have a lot of different types of bumblebees um, that have um, really large eyes, particularly the males, but um, the flies are, are a little bit different in, in shape and size with their eyes as well. And one other thing, there's kind of just a behavioral thing. So sometimes, um, a lot of times the, the flies do like this kind of stuff with their front legs. So they're kind of going like this and going mm -hmm. like this. And that's not, that's not a bee thing, that's a fly thing if you see, yes. them, if you see them doing that. <laughs> Yep, so here's another example of um, one of these, these mimics. Um, they're very, very convincing, uh, especially from certain angles that they are bees and not flies. Uh, we also have the clearing moth. Um, I have seen these, I, I saw them a lot last summer, but they are also um, a little bit, uh, or from, from a distance anyway, you might look at them and, and think that they're a bumblebee because they're they're fairly large in size and they also have a lot of fuzzy hairs like bumblebees do and, and similar colors. Um, but they have that really, really long tongue as you can see here in this photo. They have really long um, antenna that sticks straight out of their head and they have no waist. So our bumblebees have a really defined waist between, or, or in some species anyway, you can tell the difference between the thorax um, and the abdomen because because they have a waist, um, but this, our, the clearing moth, does not have a defined waist. Um, carpenter bees, which aren't super common here in Minnesota, um, are also very convincing bumblebee lookalikes. Um, their characteristics are that they're fairly large and they have a robust body. Um, they also have yellow hair on the thorax, as many of our native bumblebees do, or all of our native bumblebees do. Um, 
but their abdomens are shiny. This is one of the biggest differences between the carpenter bee and, or the carpenter bees and our bumblebees. Um, bumblebees have hairs along their abdomens, um, but the carpenter bees are shiny. Um, the carpenter bees also lack pollen baskets. Um, you can see their hind legs are hairy. Um, the males have yellow markings uh, rather than hairs on their faces. A lot of our male bumblebees have hairs on their faces. Um, and carpenter bees will nest in hard wood as opposed to um, these above or underground uh, nest cavities um, that bumblebees will build. Um, there are also some other species of bees that may look like bumblebees. They're still bees, but they're not bumblebees. Um, so this is uh, the genus Andrina. So these are mining bees. Um, they're fairly small in size, um, but they also have uh, those really, really hairy hind legs, but they don't have pollen baskets. Um, and and they're, they're very small in size. Um, if you were to compare them to a bumblebee, they're, they're a lot smaller. All right. Now we can shift gears back to where we were before um, to talk about some of our bumblebee ID stuff. I thought there were a few more slides there for the kind of the general bumblebee oh. ID stuff. Or maybe not. Let's see. There we go. Yes, you're right. You're right. Um, yes. So these are the different parts of the bumblebee that um, are important for looking at uh, when it comes to making your identifications. Um, so if we start with the head, um, there's the antenna uh, that are kind of at an angle. Um, the eyes, uh, which are really important for making IDs in a lot of different uh, species of bumblebees. Um, there's the thorax uh, behind the head. And then the abdomen. The abdomen is broken up into different abdominal segments called turga. Um, and then the hind legs of bumblebees have, the females have pollen baskets, uh, the males do not, and the um, those, those cuckoo bumblebees that I was talking about earlier, those don't have pollen baskets either. So here's um, a little bit, a different view of um, the bumblebee's body. Uh, so there's the head, um, the compound eyes, they also have three eyes in the middle called ocelli. Um, so the thorax, uh, there's the wing bases, the scutellum is the space um, that leads up to the abdomen. And then like I mentioned, the abdomen is broken up into different abdominal segments. And we'll reference those abdominal segments quite a bit when we're talking about um, different bumblebees and making IDs. Yep, so here again is a close-up version or a close-up image of um, these abdominal segments. Like I said, they're called turga, so we refer to them as T1, T2, T3, et cetera. Uh, so T1 um, is fairly small and a little bit skinnier um, than the others. Um, T2 is sometimes a little bit longer than you might expect. Um, and then T3 and T4, and you can kind of see uh, where the hairs on, on one segment stop and they begin on another one. And then um, another thing that we look at uh, for making IDs between uh, certain species um, is the cheek. Um, and this is where having really, really good photos can come in. So taking a photo of the face um, can be really important for uh, distinguishing um, what, what species you're looking at. Um, so this area is called the malar space. So um, some of our bumblebees have a short malar space, some of them have a medium, and some of them it is a little bit longer. And the antenna um, also are broken up into segments similar to the abdomen. Um, so we refer to these as F1, F2, F3, etc. cetera. Um, and this is another area, these can be really hard to get photographs of, but as cameras are getting better and better, like I mentioned, getting that photograph of the face where you can zoom in to look at the individual segments of the and 10A is really, really important for making uh, bumblebee IDs. 
And then we have the hind legs. Um, and this is really important to look at, uh, particularly when you're distinguishing between male and female bees. Um, so female bees have a, a corbicula, which is the pollen basket um, on, on their tibia. Uh, there's also a lot of hairs on um, this part of their hind legs. Um, female bees have a corbicula, male bees do not. Um, and like I, like I mentioned, uh, the um, parasitic bumblebees, uh, the, they don't have pollen baskets either. Um, uh, on there's this spike that is seen on the uh, bacitarsis, um, which is important for distinguishing between a couple species as well. And again, I'm, I'm sure we're just going to keep echoing this, that taking really good photos of all of these individual parts or even carrying a hand lens with you um, can help to make positive IDs of different species of bees. So then just, just some general differences between the females and the males. Uh, the females are often a little bit larger um, and they do have a stinger present uh, where males don't have a stinger present. Um, some species have, or, or, be, or male bees have that sort of beard on their mandibles. Um, they're often a little bit smaller than females. Um, some species of bees have white or yellow facial hairs. Um, so then looking at some of these, these differences, the female abdomen of a bumblebee has six abdominal segments, whereas the male has seven segments. Uh, the female antenna have only 12 segments, whereas the males have 13. Um, the female hind legs are wider uh, because they have that, that corbicula, that pollen basket, and the male legs um, are often a little bit thinner. So those are some of the more obvious, or I mean, it always depends on the species, but some of the differences that you can key into when you're looking for differences between male and females. And again, it's really important to get uh, photos of these different parts of the bees. So again, looking at male versus female, um, the male is a little bit more slender um, in its body and it has, and this, this is a pretty good image that shows that the antenna are a little bit longer, um, whereas our, our female bee um, is, is a little bit less slender than the male is. Um, you've got a pretty good view of her legs here too, so you can see that they're, um, they've got lots of hairs on the back of them, and her, her antenna are a little bit shorter than, than the male bee that she's next to. So the males also have these, these beards, these really fuzzy faces. So in some species of bumblebee, um, these hairs on the male faces um, will also be yellow. And that can be uh, something that's fairly easy to key into when you're looking at the differences between species. Um, but looking right off the bat, we can tell that the male, uh, the male face is a lot fuzzier than the female face. Um, big eyes is another uh, key factor in telling between males and the females. Um, Elaine showed that video earlier of that um, uh, black and gold bumblebee, that male that was perching. And one of the things that I noticed right away about that bee was how, how big his eyes were. Um, they really stand out. There's a couple bumblebee species in particular where the males have these really, really huge eyes um, that stand out um, on their head. Um, and then the males also have uh, longer antenna, their antenna have one extra segment compared to the females. And then again, we'll just look at the hind legs. Uh, so the female compared to the male, the female's hind leg is um, definitely a little bit wider and a little bit hairier uh, because she's got that pollen basket, uh, whereas the males have um, fairly, fairly skinny legs when you're comparing them to the females. So we're so then taking a look at these um, abdominal segments. Uh, so this bumblebee on the left here, this is a um, common eastern bumblebee. Uh, so T1 refers to that first abdominal segment. We can see that that first abdominal segment is yellow, uh, which is pretty good indication that this is Bombus impatiens or um, the common eastern bumblebee. Uh, the photo in the middle, um, we can take a look at those first two abdominal segments. Um, so T1 is yellow, um, and then T2 is partially brown, kind of in that sort of crescent spate or crescent shape. And then our bumblebee here on the right um, has both seg the, both of the first two segments, T1 and T2, are both all yellow. So that kind of shows um, what we're what we're referencing when we're uh, talking about T1 or or T2. 
All right. Looking at this bumblebee, how do we know if it is a male or a female? Oops. So we're taking a look at um, its eyes, the length of um, its antenna, um, and kind of its hind legs. Um, so I would believe that this is a male bumblebee. Elaine, please correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong. Um, but this has got longer antenna, uh, those kind of skinnier, skinnier hind legs. Um, this one, uh, male or female, um, there's one really um, obvious factor sometimes when we're looking at bumblebees and trying to tell the difference between male and female, um, but this is a female bumblebee uh, just looking at, at her hind legs. So this is what a, a female bumblebee will look like when she's got really, really packed full pollen baskets. So her hind legs have these really huge globs of pollen um, on them. And right, right away, we know when we see bees that have large um, lumps of pollen like that on their hind legs that they are females. All right, this one, male or female, as this also looks like one of those, um, one of the common Eastern bumblebees. Um, it's got longer antenna. Um, its body looks a little bit more slender. Um, so this one is also a male. All right, and then another one, uh, male or female. Um, this one looks like its hind legs are a little bit wider, a little bit fuzzier. Um, yeah, so this one is a female. <laughs> and on the, the females, with their when they have those pollen baskets, sometimes you'll be able to see these long curving hairs that are all around that are making the basket. So the basket has the curved part of the leg that goes in and then those long um, pointy hairs around the edges. All right. This is, I don't think this is updated for this year, obviously. Since the, the, you know, the dates are going to be the same. But they are the same? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So every year, um, uh, there is a backyard bumblebee count that happens between July 23rd and August 1st, um, where we encourage folks to go out and take photos of all the bumblebees that they're seeing um, in their yard or their neighborhood or their community and upload those onto iNaturalist. And this can be a great chance to just practice some of your uh, bumblebee photographing skills or your bumblebee IDing skills uh, for for your bumblebee atlas surveys. Um, and since we know that you are all a passionate group um, of when it comes to bumblebees, um, this is another chance to get out and, and take a look at, at some more bumblebees. All right. All right. I'll try this again. All right. <laughs> so, so yeah, now we're moving into some of the species. And the idea here is, you know, that you don't need to, to um, you don't need to be able to tell all these, to, to ID all these bumblebees to species, but just taking photos so that we can tell them apart. And um, these first three are, are the ones you're most likely to run into out there. And, um, and for these, so for the Bombus impatiens, the common Eastern bumblebee, the main thing we're gonna to look at with all three of these species is what's going on on the abdomen. So this one has that first turgite is yellow and then the rest are black. The males have a really similar color pattern. So one of the reasons why we wanted to, to talk about male versus female is that sometimes they do have really different color patterns and it can help to figure out if it's a male or female First off, just to, so you get, um, if you're using that ID guide, you get to the right side of the page to, to figure out what you're looking at. Um, so um, males are really similar. They have a lot more yellow on the front of the face. Um, so here's here's a photo we were just looking at of a male, <laughs> uh, Bombus impatiens. Here's a female on a flower. Um, sometimes they can be weird. So in general, bumblebees can be variable, but it's fairly common for impatience and a lot of other bumblebees actually, some um, where their hairs are usually black, sometimes they will be red or orange. So something to kind of um, watch out for and not be, not be tricked by. 
So the two-spotted bumblebee, Bombus bimaculatus, they have that same basic thing as in patients where T1 is all yellow, but then on T2, they'll have these two spots. There'll be this W that's kind of in the middle of that second abdominal segment. Males have a similar color pattern. They have yellow on the face. Sometimes the male two-spotteds can have a lot more yellow on them too, and they can get a little bit tricky. Um, so yeah, here is this Bombus bimaculatus nest. Um, so you can see the, the two spots there. The queen is keeping her, her wings over her back, so it's hard to see, but from the side there, you could see, see the two spots coming in. Um, so it does, sometimes videos are nice for ID because you can get a bunch of different angles on the bee. Um, they can, the queens can vary a lot. Um, those two spots can be pretty big or they can be pretty little, but, um, but looking for that yellow in the middle of T2, black on the sides. Um, it can be kind of hard to see what, with, depending on the angle that the light's going through the hairs, but we can see at those two spots there here, it's really clear. So this black line here, that's just happening because the hairs, this bee has her abdomen kind of bent over, the hairs are lifted up and we're seeing through to the darker exoskeleton, their cuticle there. So, um, so that isn't a hair pattern, that's just um, a, a black line showing um, showing through their hairs. Here's a nice view of the, the two spots. So here's one of those tricky males. They do still have black at the edge of T2, yellow in the middle, but then they have a bunch of other yellow on them as well. Bombus griseocolis, the brown belted bumblebee, again, starting with that same kind of thing. All these bees have mostly yellow on the thorax. They have kind of a spot in the middle that's black. T1 is yellow, and then on T2, they have this crescent shape, this swoosh that'll have um, brown or kind of a, a rusty red brownish color. Males are really similar. They, these males do have, um, have large eyes. Can I jump in for a sec too with this yeah. one? Uh, something I've noticed with, with Bombus griseocolis compared to Bombus impatiens and Bombus bimaculatus is that they're a little bit different of a yellowy color. Um, it's a little bit more of like a, a mustardy yellow that's more similar to that, that brown of their brown belts uh, than the common eastern or the two-spotted bumblebee. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, so there is variability in that swoosh. Sometimes that swoosh takes up most of T2. Sometimes it's, it's narrow. Um, but so, so just, just something to be aware of and getting photos of it. It sometimes, you know, those wings will be over the thorax. It does help to, to see from the side, to be able to see, um, where that swoosh is. And again, um, the grizzly colas are one of the species with, with big eyes. Um, there are some with bigger eyes, but, um, there also can be worn hairs. So a lot of times actually fairly commonly on the queens, they'll um, have worn down hairs just in the middle of their tergite, the T2, which can make it look like it's two spots, but watch out for those more brownish hairs. Um, and the, um, the main thing to look for, for, for comparing these, um, you can also, um, look at the, the hair on the top of their heads. So um, if it does have that kind of worn spot and you, this might be, um, you know, you might think this is two spots, it helps us to see the hairs on the top of the heads. So the important photos to take for these, for the big three, for impatience, Bimac and Griseocolis, if um, you're thinking your bee looks like that, making sure your photo shows those first two segments of the abdomen. It can either be from the top or from the side, but just making sure that we can see what's going on on the, those first two segments. And then also being able to see what's happening just right at the top of the head are the, the most important shots. Besides the basic, you're taking you know the top, the side, the front of the face. We always want those shots, but just making sure that these are the features we can see when you take those photos. Um, so yeah, there's another Grizzly Colas worker, a uh, little, little test here. So, um, for this next B, what do you think we have? 
<laughs> so we're looking at the at that T1 and T2 here. We're seeing T1 all yellow. That is the common eastern bumblebee or Bombus impatiens. And this one is, is a worker. Um, kind of hard to tell because we can't see her legs, but um, not seeing a ton of the, the lighter hair out front. This one is a bit of a tricky one, but we're seeing long antennae, skinny back legs. This is a male. T1 is yellow. T2, we're seeing black at the sides. And remember, sometimes these can be weird. This is a bimaculatus male. About this one. So this one, we're tricking you. <laughs> and this is actually a honeybee. You're really likely to see honeybees out there. They tend to have this more kind of um, bullet shape to their body. A lot, they can vary a lot in color. So they can be this light amber color or they can be nearly black. And um, they're, they're, they can be pretty fuzzy. They're usually not as fuzzy as the bumblebees, um, but they also will be collecting pollen. So you'll see um, pollen balls in their, on their hind legs and um, some sites they might be, be very common. All right, I wanted to also highlight, especially the rusty patch bumblebee. So this isn't a bee that um, everybody will be seeing everywhere, but um, Kat, Kathy had mentioned when she was starting surveying down south, it was someplace people hadn't been looking for a while and she found rusty patch bumblebees down there. So they were, they used to be throughout most of Minnesota, not as common up north, but um, there still are a lot of places that are outside of those current kind of uh, areas we have um, where we know they are. They used to be in a lot of places and they may still show up there. So definitely need to keep your eye out for these and be extra careful if, um, if you do run into them. And fortunately, they have some pretty clear ID things. So um, on the thorax, those the other bees we're looking at were mostly yellow. These have black hairs between the wing bases and some black hairs coming back in either, um, we call it a thumbtack, we also call it an umbrella shape, black hairs on the head. And then the rusty patch can actually be kind of hard to see. So for them, they also have T1 is all yellow, T2 will have that rusty patch in the center. Um, the males are fairly similar. The queens actually are, are very different and just have T1 and 2 are all yellow. They also tend not to have that thumbtack. But um, that thumbtack shape is, is pretty distinctive. Um, so, so even when they have their hind wings covering up the rusty patch, you may be able to see that, that shape on their thorax. Um, the, the males, sometimes that band is, is less well-defined. There'll be more yellow hairs mixed in, but the males will have that as well. The rusty patch, um, you know, here's a view from the side. It can be sometimes be confusing if it's a shadow or a trick of the light, but, um, but that orangish hairs showing up there. Um, so, so it can be pretty important to make sure you have good lighting on your bee so we can make sure that what we're seeing isn't a shadow and it is those hairs. Um, and so here's a, a patch that's really light but we also can still see um, you know, the pattern that's going on on the thorax. Here's a nice, really clear um, rusty patch. And one thing to note is that on the far side of that rusty patch, there are yellow hairs before then the rest of the abdomen is black. So that if the, the brown belted bumblebee, you might remember they have that brown rusty swoop that's similar to this, but they would have black hairs on this far side as whereas um, the rusty patch has yellow hairs. A subtle character to look for is um, they, they often have a, a, a fair amount of black hairs kind of in this back part of the thorax under the wing base. Um, both on the workers and the queens. So I mentioned the queens actually don't have a rusty patch. The queens are really important. We really do want information about them, um, but we can't rely on looking for that rusty patch. Um, but um, they still are, are distinctive enough. They're, they're very large for queens. They have really short hair. Um, those first two segments are all yellow and then the rest is black. There are some other species that have that pattern, but the size 
um, makes a big difference. Um, so, so here's a, a, a rusty patch queen from a couple angles. Um, though those first two segments end up taking almost half of her abdomen. Those first two segments are really, really big. They also, um, here's, here's showing the different sizes. So these are all queen bumblebees and um, Athenis are one of the, the larger queen bumblebees that, will, that you can see out there. So I mentioned um, you know, that, that we do want to make sure that we're protecting these from harm. They are federally, federally endangered at risk of extinction. So we do need to take some special care, which I just want to mention quickly. So um, looking out for them, being familiar with that ID pattern, making sure you kind of review things before you go out and are, are catching bees. So just as you're, as you're collecting, keep your eyes out for them. Um, if you catch something and you think this might be a rusty patch, pause the timer on your survey, take a quicker look. If it does end up looking like it is a, a rusty patch bumblebee, photograph it and release it as soon as you can. And then um, if you do find a rusty patch bumblebee during your survey, complete your survey at your location that day. Um, keep your eye out and try to avoid collecting any additional ones. And then um, email me or the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas email as soon as possible with those photos and with the location. And then um, unfortunately at your next survey, we're gonna have to have you move to a different location um, just because we we um, don't want to, to um, put you at, at risk, it's, it's better if you um, do not handle the rusty patch bumblebees unless you are covered by a, a recovery permit. We will have a special rusty patch bumblebee training that we still have to actually just pick a date, but it will be in early June. We'll be doing it as a webinar. There are some grids that it's required for, for that. Um, so if your grid is partly covered by rusty patch bumblebee areas um, where they've been seen in recent years, then even if you're outside of those areas, we want you to have um, some of this special training. We do recommend it for everybody just because they can show up everywhere. And so we'll just get into a few more details of, of ID, um, but cover the basics here, but more details available and we do, do recommend it. Um, so important shots to take if you do find the rusty patch bumblebee, getting those first two segments of the abdomen, making sure the light is clear, taking a picture of that, the top of the thorax, the front of the face can help too. There's some, some differences in the, the shapes of the faces and the top of the head. Uh, so we've got uh, a few more bees to look at here. So this one is a little bit hard to see, but but this one does have these two spots in the middle. This is, um, but this one we're just doing, is it aphanous, is it rusty patch bumblebee or not? So, um, so what do you think? Rusty patch or not? You may, might have, I don't know, are there thumbs down things? You can put thumbs up in a reaction if you think it's a rusty patch bumblebee. This one is not a rusty patch bumblebee. It had that rusty color, but then there's black on the other side. So this was a brown belted bumblebee. About this one. This one is a rusty patch bumblebee. This is a rusty patch bumblebee male. So we see the rusty patch there and then yellow on the opposite side. About this one. This one, it helps to know the flower. So this one is on a uh, Joe Pye weed. So it's a pretty big bee. This is actually a rusty patch queen. Oh, this one, this one, there's a lot of bright orange and red there. This is not, this is Bombus ternarius, the tri-colored bumblebee. Love this one. This one is a pretty nice shot. You can see stuff going on on the thorax and on the abdomen there. This is a rusty patch bumblebee. 
All right, um, moving on to some other bumblebees here. Um, we've got uh, a, a couple of bumblebees that we have here in Minnesota that we call the very yellow bumblebees. So most of their abdomen is completely yellow. And we have two different species here. Um, Fervidus, which is sometimes, it's sometimes it's called the golden northern. It's also just called the yellow bumblebee and Borealis, the boreal bumblebee. So for the golden northern, they're, they're fairly large. Um, they have black hairs on the head, long face. Um, and main thing we're looking for is those um, lots of yellow down the abdomen. Here are uh, a couple photos. Of, of these bees, um, can see that black band between the wings is also important. So the, the um, northern amber or boreal bumblebee also has that black band between the wing bases. They also have um, black hairs on the side of the thorax and yellow hairs on the front of the face. So here we can see um, these black hairs on the thorax, lots of yellow hair coming out the front of the face. Here's a, a male noticing all that, uh, all that yellow hair on the abdomen, those black hairs across the thorax. So in comparing these two, the, the, they look very similar. If you see bumblebees that, are, that are, have a lot of yellow on them, look at what's happening on the front of the face. If there's lots of yellow, it's borealis. If you see black, um, on the side, it's, it's also Borealis, but Fervidus will have mostly black on the front of the face and mostly yellow on the side. There's one other tricky thing if you have a male. So this is where it does help to pay attention to the males. There's one other species where the, the females look very different, but the males actually have a lot of yellow. And um, for, for these, for Pennsylvanicus to tell them apart, from these two other very yellow bees, we need to look at what's happening on the thorax where they will have a lot of black coming back to the edge of the thorax. Um, the Pennsylvanicus, um, so here you can see they do have a lot of yellow going down their, their abdomen, but they will have yellow hairs at the very tip of their abdomen. So um, for the important shots to get for the very yellow bumblebees, getting a shot that where we can see the hairs on the front of the face, the side of the thorax, the top of the thorax. And um, if you have males, also trying to make sure you get a shot that where we can see the, the tip of the abdomen. The next group is are the T1 and 2 yellow bumblebees. And we're all actually only going to talk about three of these. There are, are a couple other species that um, aren't very common. Um, there, there is information about them on that, that two pager. If you do uh, th think you see them, you can, can double check there. But these other three are, are fairly common. So the half black bumblebee, Bombus vagans, has um, the main thing we're looking for is not a lot of black hairs on the thorax, kind of limited to that center spot. And the first two abdominal segments are yellow. Males are similar. They have a bit more yellow. These are smaller, pretty shaggy bees. So here's a nice shot where you can see what's happening on those first two segments. Yellow hair is on top of the head as well. Um, here's a, a fuzzier male. And you know, so here's there's some worn hairs, but we, we can see that this is supposed to be yellow hairs there. The male sometimes gonna have a bunch of extra yellow hairs. So this one is, has this kind of whole ring of yellow hairs around the end of their abdomen. So Bombus sandersoni, Sanderson's bumblebee is the main one that gets very confusing. So they also have T1 and 2 yellow. They tend to have more black hairs between the wing bases. Um, but um, so, so here's kind of the typical Sandersoni where they'll, as opposed to the, the vegans would have yellow hairs here, but Sandersoni um, will have more black. Sometimes the Sandersoni will have this yellow at the end, but not always. So unfortunately, the main thing we need to look at are their faces. And um, Elise had talked about the cheeks or the malar space. So this is the space between their eye and their mandible. And it's 
long in Vegans and less long in Sandersoni. So, um, so it does help to just get a, a really close up photo um, if you can, just, just or just at least in focus of the side of the face. Um, and this is mostly, I'll, I'll show you in a second, this mostly is important. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're down in Southern Minnesota, this is less important because we don't see Sandersoni down there, but through a lot of the rest of the state, we do sometimes lump these together, but if we can get photos to separate them, um, it, it's great. <laughs> um, so some of the coloration we can use too, but um, so, so, so I mentioned the, the vegans tend to have more yellow on their thorax. For the males, <laughs> the coloration is kind of all over the place. And what we really need to see are the antennae. So this one is even harder to get a good picture of, but if you have the bee chilled out, if you're able to, to get up close, if you know you have a male and you're seeing T1 and 2 are all yellow, getting this shot of the antennae helps us separate them. So, um, so there are some, some hairs that show up on the, the underside of the Sandersoni antennae, as well as just the, the length of these segments, we can, we can look at it and figure out the difference between these. So um, here's an example of a photo that a, a volunteer had, had shared, and it was enough for us to zoom in and be able to, to look at what's going on with the, the antenna and call it Sandersoni. <laughs> So I mentioned the, the difference in range. So vegans are found throughout Minnesota. Sandersoni are, are really only up in the northern part of the state. But you know, there is some overlap here. So really, we only, um, you know, if you are, if your grids are down in any of this part of the state, you can, you don't have to worry about getting those, those cheek photos, those antenna photos. But if you're anywhere up in the northern part of Minnesota, um, that does, does just help us to be able to, to pick those apart. It's always good to get to species if we can um, to be able to, to really figure out what's going on with these bees. Bombus perplexus, the perplexing bumblebee, is another one um, that has yellow on T1 and 2. Sometimes, um, usually it also has yellow on, on T3. And um, it doesn't. It has. It will have um, scattered yellow hairs, kind of all across the thorax. So um, they also will have um, black hairs on the side of the thorax. And they're they're smaller bees, very shaggy. Here's one with with this yellow, kind of showing up all the way down to T3. You can see this very shaggy yellow thorax. Um, Here's a very, very yellow one, which you might be confused with um, those very yellow bumblebees, but you'll notice that there's no black band on the thorax. All those yellow hairs are there. So the important shots, if you see bees that have T1 to 2 all yellow, getting a shot of the top of the thorax, the side of the face, so trying to get a view of that cheek. And also if, um, if you have males, if you can get the um, antennae in, in focus. Touching on the T1 black bumblebees, so we have three different species we're going to talk about where T1 is, is mostly black. They tend to have a lot of black on their thorax as well. Uh, Nevidensis is a species that um, we're just starting to, to document in Minnesota, um, both up north and down south, but not very commonly seen. Um, so it, it's great if you find it, but, um, but less likely. So the black and gold bumblebee, these are our really biggest bumblebees um, that we have in Minnesota. Both the males and the females are really big. So the females have mostly black on the thorax. T1 is yellow, then T2 and three, sorry, T1 is black, T2 and three are yellow, and then the rest is black. The males have a very different color pattern, but they're very distinctive in terms of their large eyes. We also tend to, um, 
see fewer of these just because of their behavior. So these are the bumblebees that are perching and chasing females around. Because of their big eyes, they're, they kind of see you coming, they're harder to catch. Um, we just see fewer of them in, in collections, um, but they, they're pretty distinctive, which is their large size and their, their really big eyes. So the, the key characters are looking at um, that, that T1 is all dark for the black and gold bumblebee. And um, also we look for some yellow hairs on the top of the head, which can be a little bit hard to track down. Again, here are those, those really huge eyes on the males. Here we're seeing um, that, that T1 has lots of black. The black often goes down onto T2. Here, when we're talking about the yellow hairs on the head, it can be confusing because they have these, these yellow hairs on the thorax that come up close, but we're just looking, we're, we have to try to separate and look just at the hairs that are happening right at the top of the head. So Bombus pensivanicus is a species that's also of conservation concern. It's currently being petitioned for listing as an endangered species. No decision has been made yet but there is concern about this species. So we really do want to be able to, to track their populations. And these you can see are very similar, lots of black on the thorax, black on T1, then the yellow and, and in the middle, black at the end, but they have um, the um, T on, on T1, there'll be some yellow there usually, and the top of their head is all black. So um, here we can see those, the, the not seeing the yellow hairs popping up on the head here. Hard to see what's going on on the abdomen, but we're seeing a nice big B. This one is, remember if I mentioned these males when we were talking about the very yellow bumblebees. So these um, can, uh, the, the males can be confused with those very yellow bumblebees because they are mostly yellow on the abdomen. For telling these two apart, um, really we need to see, the best thing I like to see is what's going on on T1 and T2, uh, where Pensilvanicus has more yellow, Oricomus has more black on that first abdominal segment. But this is something that varies. Another thing we can like to see is the, the color on the top of the head. So this is what I'm talking about with this yellow showing up just kind of at the, these two kind of clumps of yellow hair at the very back of the head, whereas we don't see that on, um, on Pennsylvanicus. Um, here we're seeing those yellow hairs on T1 in Pennsylvanicus, but black hairs even going up, down onto T2 for oricomus. Another thing that we can like to see are what's going on with the ocelli. So we've been talking about the big eyes on males. We're talking about these compound eyes they have on the sides of the heads. Bumblebees also have these three simple eyes on top of the head. And if we can get a shot of the bumblebee showing them from the top, we can, can look at where these three eyes are on their head that can help us pick these species apart from each other. There is one other bee that fits into this group, the yellow banded bumblebee. So they also have T1 black, then a bunch of yellow black again, but their key identifying feature is they're really round. So these are much smaller, really round bees. Um, they'll also sometimes see this fringe of hairs um, down at the back. So, so here's a nice shot um, showing those that fringe of hairs. You can see this is a smaller, rounder bee than those other bees that have that T1 black. And here's a, a shot of the same bee from a couple angles. So the important photos to take for if you see that T1 is all black are um, getting a shot that can show us the first two segments of the abdomen, the top of the head, if you can get a shot of those simple eyes, and then also a clear view of the tip of the abdomen. So we're, we're getting through here. Um, breezing through these bumblebees, we're moving into the red bumblebees, which we're going to focus on Rufus cinctus, the red belted bumblebee, 
and Bombus ternarius, the tri-colored bumblebee. There are a couple other species. Huntii is one that is only found basically on the border with North Dakota, um, far western Minnesota, and not very commonly seen there. Melanopygus is one that has been showing up more, um, and volunteers here have been helping us to document them, up, especially in northern Minnesota. Um, but they are a bit more rare. Just be aware of um, bees that may have more kind of black hairs mixed in. And if you're seeing bees with, with red that don't quite fit with, with ternarius or these other things, just make sure to take a bunch of photos so we can see what's going on with them. Rufusinctus, the, the red belted bumblebee, the confusing thing here is that um, they don't always have red hairs, but they sometimes do. They're generally smaller. Um, they have um, this really variable color pattern. So um, all of these different bees pictured here are all Rufusinctus, red belted bumblebees, even though they don't all have the red hairs, but you can see they're, they all have this um, pretty shaggy kind of smaller bees. And there are a couple rules of thumb that can help you figure out what they, they are. First of all, if you see a bee and it just looks weird and doesn't fit in with a lot of other color patterns, it um, maybe maybe Rufus Sancta is a good chance. So um, the basic things are um, that there is this base model where that T1 is always yellow and then T2 always has a crescent. What varies is what's on the other side of that crescent. Um, so, so it could be orange or red, it could be black. Um, they also often have this um, stripe of, of yellow on further down the abdomen. And they're the only species that have red and black hairs that are mixed together on the, on the same segment. Another thing that's kind of easier to pick out when you're just seeing them flying around is, um, is what's going on on the thorax. So their thorax, they have a fair number of black hairs between their thorax, but they also kind of thin out and, and um, looks kind of shiny. So it ends up being this eye shape between the, the wing bases, which um, we just call it the, the eye of Sauron to uh, just remember, uh, remember it more easily and just uh, an appreciation for the, uh, when you're trying to ID bumblebees, the evil feature of extreme color variation, even within one nest of, of um, the red belt, belt of bumblebee, they'll have multiple different color patterns. So this is, is something you can, can um, notice on the bees if you're trying to, to pick them out. The tricolored bumblebee, Bombus ternarius, this is actually our most common bumblebee up in the northern part of the state. So if you have grids up north, you're highly likely to see these bees. Um, they have, similar to the rusty patch, they have this kind of thumbtack shape, but it's thicker and more distinct. And they have a very um, clear color pattern where T1 is yellow, T2 and 3 are red or orange, T4 is yellow, and then T5 is black. The, the males are similar. Sometimes the, um, the thumbtack isn't so clear, and they'll have more yellow hairs on their heads. But um, here you can see this really thick band between the wing bases for this umbrella of black hairs, really bright colors, very distinct. Here we can see, um, see again, lots of, of black hairs going through here. The orange can sometimes fade. This one is, is very clear, but watch out for specimens. Sometimes those orange colors do fade. To, to yellow, so it can become more subtle. Um, but but a, in general, a very distinctive, very um, clear bee. So if you do see bumblebees with a good amount of red on them, getting shots of those first two segments of the abdomen is really important, as well as the, the top of the thorax. I also just want to mention, this is our last group, we're gonna talk about the cuckoo bumblebees. 
Uh, so, so Elisa already talked about their, their biology earlier, where these are bumblebees that don't make nests of their own. They go in and take over nests of, of other bumblebees, really fascinating behavior. And um, there are a, a few different species of parasitic bumblebees. Some of them are extremely rare. Some of them are very difficult to ID. So the main thing we want you to do is just know how to figure out whether you have a parasitic bumblebee. And if you do, just take a lot of photos. <laughs> so um, the, if you have a female, they won't have the pollen basket. They'll have hairs that go kind of across their hind leg where the pollen basket would normally be. And they're normally kind of a bit thinner. They also have really big heads. So um, you can see the, from, the, from the top, they'll be thicker or from the side, you can see these really thick heads. Here's uh, one on a, on, a, on a male. And this is just um, comparing to, to how thick a head would normally be. <laughs> so almost twice as, as thick once you, once you know what you're looking for. The females, their abdomens are generally tapered at the end. Sometimes they're curled underneath. Um, and they usually have dark hairs. A lot of times um, they'll, they'll, there won't be a lot of hairs. They'll be mostly bald. But um, the hairs will be mostly dark, except for some yellow hairs at the side and at the end of the abdomen. Here we can see this abdomen kind of curling over light hairs at the end of the abdomen. No corbicula, no pollen basket here, this thick head. The most common parasitic bee that you'll see, the one you're most likely to see if you do see a parasitic, is the lemon cuckoo bumblebee. So I'm just going to talk about ID for this one, um, where it's mostly light hairs on the thorax. Um, a bit of, of some light hairs on the third tergite on the abdomen. The males, actually some people confuse these with rusty patch because they have a, uh, this, that kind of thumbtack or umbrella shape on their thorax, but they'll have T1 through three will be completely yellow. And they also don't, don't have the rusty patch. So here's a picture of the female cuckoo bee. We can, on um, lemon cuckoo bee, we can see the really thick head here, uh, no pollen basket. Here's uh, the, the male. So, so you can see why someone might think this was a rusty patch, just the way the shadow is going through here. But we're seeing yellow all the way down to the third segment. And also, if we could see the head, you'd see it had that big, thick head. And kind of this long tapering abdomen on the male here. So if you do see a, a cuckoo bumblebee, the important shots to get are to get a shot of the end of the abdomen and also get a shot where we can see what's going on with the, with the antennae if it, if it is a, a male. So basically there are, are some cuckoo bumblebees we won't even be able to identify from photos, but most of them we can. We just need a few more photos um, and they're super interesting bees that, that we do wanna keep track of um, as we can. So um, we have another little kind of just running through some, some bees and seeing if, if you can remember what we talked about, uh, what these bees might be. I know I've been using a lot of the, the scientific names and not always using the common names, um, but this one, I'm seeing a bunch of black hairs between the wing bases. Um, yellow on T1 and 2, but I'm not seeing yellow further down. I'm just seeing red, orange, and kind of a mix with black hairs. So this is a um, Rufus cinctus, a red belted bumblebee. So if it was a tricolored, we would have been seeing more yellow showing up on the, the other side and, and not so much mixing of the colors. All right, here we've got another bee. By the way, we can safely say this is a female. We can see the pollen basket is full there. 
look and see what's going on on T1 is all yellow and then the rest is black. This is a common Eastern bumblebee, Bombus impatiens. All right, this one, male or female, it's a little bit hard to see what's going on um, with the with the antennae, but we're seeing a bunch of yellow here. So I would suspect looking from that, you can start suspecting that it's a male. T1 and T2, we're seeing this swoop here with this rusty brown color. This is a brown belted bumblebee, Bombus griseocolis. And um, some of the reason why I know this one is a male is just because the Bombus um, griseocolis, the brown belted bumblebee workers, they're kind of robust. They're kind of rounder. You can see the super ball shaped round thorax um, for, for this bumblebee. If we could see the eyes, we could see they were a little bigger. They also really love um, cone flowers. <laughs> All right, this one is easy for female, male, right? We can see pollen there. Hard to see what's going on the end, but it looks like we've got yellow on T1, then orange, and it looks like yellow is showing up again underneath, seeing lots of black between the wing bases. This one is a tricolor, the ternarius. All right, this one, looks like one of our very yellow bumblebees. We can see the black between the wing bases. So we had the two different ones. We remember we needed to see what was going on on the front of the face and then on the side of the thorax. We can't really see her face here, but looking at the side of the thorax that looks all light colored. This is a Fervis, the golden northern or yellow bumblebee. All right. <laughs> so, um, so we've we've made it through all of these bees. There's um, always more to learn with idea of bumblebees, but hopefully this gives you an idea, an overview of bees that you'll be likely to see out there. Hopefully, um, you can feel like you know which photos will will help us ID things. Um, you know, we do have um, our, our Facebook group that you can ask questions to each other. We also have our email list, um, which you're, if you've signed up for a grid, you're definitely on that. <laughs> but we do have, um, if you just want to sign up for the email list, there's also a sign up spot on the front page of our website. We are also going to be sharing our email list with the Xerces Society. So, um, so now our, our Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas is part of this larger Midwest Bumblebee Atlas. So we're lucky to have a, another a, a coordinator um, who has um, an, an amazing bumblebee researcher who's coming to us from, um, from University of, of Madison in Wisconsin where she's been doing her postdoc. So Jenny Pujasek, is um, going to be up here uh, working in Minnesota, helping us with some trainings. And um, in general, for this Midwest, Midwest Atlas, we'll have some, there'll be some emails that kind of cover the whole Midwest area. And um, so, so um, just be aware that you may get, you may be getting some emails from, um, from the overall Bumble, Midwest Bumblebee Atlas and Bumblebee Atlas projects, as well as um, our our own email list that we're managing it here in um, in Minnesota. And I see um, Beth, you have your your hand up. If yeah, you want I to, ask a question. Um, it's a little bit. It's more about heat. So in I have a shady well kind of shady yard very sandy so i have a lot of brown belted and uh, two spotted and a lot of black and gold and the last two summers last summer i i you know you worry about the big girls because it was really really hot and usually when the red bee balm opens up they're all over it i've got eight patches in my third of an acre i mean they just love it so when it's very hot 
do they kind of hang out a little bit more, especially when, you know, it didn't cool down at night? Do they, are they okay just kind of hanging out for, you know, a couple of days to say, I'm going to avoid the heat for a while? Is that something common with bumblebees? Right. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're very good at, at regulating their, their heat, um, uh, regulating their body temperature in general. They have ways to kind of shunt heat out and, or, you know, stay warm when they're, when they're colder, but they do definitely have, have limits with what they can tolerate. Um, I mean, I've been out serving, sometimes we're out serving bumblebees on days when it's, you know, over hundred degrees Fahrenheit out there and the bees will be out there. There just won't be as many of them. They do okay. definitely start hanging back. Um, by that time of the year where we're getting to temperatures like that, they usually have, you know, the colony is built up pretty well. They usually have pollen and nectar stored in their nest that can last for a couple of days. So, okay. um, you know, I, I do, it is kind of a worry when we have really extended, really hot um, periods, but, um, but, you know, they can get out when things are a little cooler in the morning. They, you know, they, they find ways to, to manage. Well, eventually it's like, I worried, it's like, where's the big girls usually when this opens up and then all of a sudden they're all there. And I mean, I've just got dozens of them all over the place. So it's pretty cool to see. Um, and just one other, I took a video of a mole must've run into a bumblebee nest. I knew where the nest kind of was. I didn't dig it up later, but it was just, I took video of like all these confused worker bees, just like, we don't know what happened. So, um, you know, I don't know if, if it would be something I should post to iNaturalist just to say, here's kind of an interesting phenomenon. You can see where the mole, and I don't know if does, do moles eat bumblebee nests and, and larva? Is, is that something, I don't know if it just accidentally hit it and it just um, turned around or if it was deliberately heading for the nest. Right. There, there's a lot we still have to learn about, um, you know, who's who's predating the bumblebee nests. Um, with, there's a, a master's student here, Chan Dolan, in the Caribou Native Bee Lab, who's been studying bumblebee nesting. And she was monitoring um, a good number of nests last summer, and almost half of them were, um, were destroyed by something or another. Um, you know, before it got to the end of the season. And she's actually putting up some trap cameras this year to try to, to, to see who it was um, that was yeah. that was going in there. But definitely all kinds of different um, rodents and small mammals will, um, will, you know, try to get into bumblebee nests. They're a great food source. Um, and, you know, sometimes they're just kind of sharing the same spaces. I'm sure they also just run into each other randomly. But yeah. those kind of observations, yeah, on iNaturalist, if you do see a nest, there's also a spot within Bumblebee Watch that's specifically for bumblebee nests. Oh, okay. reporting I, for bumblebee nests. Okay, because I did have one I couldn't see because it was under a rock, but I there was a couple sites in my yard that I did observe where them coming in and out. So yeah. Yeah, so there's there's a couple of questions about the different kinds of classes that are that are coming up, and um, so so the the one that we're doing at the arboretum next Saturday and the one down in Fairbo are ones that um, you know that we are running as the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas, and will be similar to this, but we'll have um, specimens as well for people to look at instead of just looking at photos of the different bees. Um, we'll we'll have um, Sometimes, so we usually actually talk a little bit less about the biology and ecology. We do have videos available on that already. So we have a little bit more time to talk about ID because we also have specimens to look at for those sessions. Um, it's gonna be fairly similar um, with the course up at Jay Cook, but we're also, we're co-teaching with, with a couple of other people. And so um, I'm, you know, we'll, we'll all, all the teachers will be bringing different, different things to the table um, and less details about the, the Atlas protocols. We will be covering them, but, um, but in a bit less detail. Um, in terms of classes being required, we just, we want you to take the training that you had today and then um, if you are in surveying where rusty patch bumblebees are likely to be found, that's the only other required training. Um, otherwise, um, it's kind of 
up, up to you if you want to take some of these extra things, have the, the extra experience um, with, with some of the, the in-person options, but mostly covering the same material. We just want to offer it both ways, especially since we're, we're not getting all across the state. We want to make sure we offer things virtually uh, as well as in person. And in future years, we will be offering um, more workshops through different parts of the state as we're able to, to get out there. And I have a question. Um, <laughs> I am embarrassed to say I can't afford to come to the gathering conference next weekend but I'm 10 minutes away from the landscape arboretum. Mm -hmm. uh, can I stop by and say hello? And I've got a membership and just say hello and introduce myself and see everybody and whatever. Is there gonna be a table or something that I can stop by? Um, well, I mean, yeah, Elise and I will be there most of the day. We're giving another uh, workshop in the, in the morning um, on a different topic. Um, I'm definitely up for that. You know, I don't know how they're managing the conference in terms of, you know, letting you in. I, I, I bet if you explain at the, at the front that you just want to go say hi, I, I, I bet that they would understand. I actually have to be there every, um, they have something else every Sunday morning that I, that I participate in anyway. And, and I'm always in the building over there on Sunday. So, uh, but, but yeah, just, I mean, just to say hi and, you know, whatever, I appreciate it. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I do see um, another question from Nicole that was was back a little bit in the chat about um, if it's beneficial to survey and get plant information, other habitat information where Rusty Patch is found, even if you don't um, handle or document the other bees. And, um, and you know, it's, um, it's always good to, to get information about where Rusty Patch are. So um, it, it's, it's nice to get a snapshot of the other communities, uh, the, the uh, rest of the bumblebee community around there. So I know we have had, had volunteers in other years that do just do those kind of photograph only surveys. And those are nice to see just a picture of, of what's going on there. Um, and it, you know, even without, without handling handling the the bees um so so yeah it, and um you know it, more information is always better it does it is most useful if we're doing the same protocols because um we're, we're trying to get kind of a big picture of what's happening here so it's hard if, if too many things are happening in different ways but um i'd say either you know following the the survey protocols where you can or um, trying to just go in and, and take a bunch of photos, document, you know, floral use um, in areas where you, you can't handle the bees, that's, that's still something that's, that's useful. Okay, cool. Because my question comes from the, the more I read about ecology and the more I learn about, you know, just, just the relationships between species are absolutely fascinating. And it, it seems to me that, that we don't really have a, a super complete picture of any species really and the all of the relationships that there that happen between species and and how it's like a domino effect where something could be affecting one population but it's they're three degrees separated because it's affecting something something is affecting something else that doesn't directly affect them but it's affecting something that's their food source or it's it's it, it's really just it's really amazing and complicated. And so that's the basis of that question was, is it sometimes helpful to have just really like, because I, I don't think you even know all the time when you go on the field, what is actually going to be really interesting or really beneficial, or there's just so much unknown there. There's just so much, it's so intricate and so amazing. Yeah. And I, I'd say even, you know, with, with the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, even with areas where, you know, where we have the, the grid closed off, um, you know, wanting people to have the permit, there's still definitely tons of spots where they're not specifically dom um, documented in that immediate area. And that does have implications for, 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 for recovery and for protection. And so just um, getting, so there it helps to just have photos documenting, you know, that, that species presence there as well. But, but you're absolutely right. There's tons to learn about, about the habitat associations and floral associations and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, more information is always good. Um, we're already at 1206. So I want to be mindful of people's Saturdays and to, to thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us. And um, Elise and I can can hang out here for a few minutes if people still have questions. Um, but um, you are, uh, are <laughs> the training is officially capped off here and um, you are free to go and, and enjoy your Saturdays. And um, we will uh, be in touch with the dates for the Rusty Patch trainings and um, other opportunities as, as they come up. We probably we will also be planning a couple of um, in-person workshops that we'll, we'll likely do around the, the Twin Cities here once the bumblebees are out more, um, just to, to do some in-person stuff to go over collecting and things like that for people who, um, rather than just seeing a little video for a couple minutes, if you wanna see it in person of, of how we do that, um, we, we try to do that as well um, to, to get you prepared to get out there, as well as we'll have some check-ins once you've started surveying to just make sure we're, we're answering all your questions. So thank you so much um, and look forward to seeing your bees.